All right, welcome to lecture number 26. We're going to finish up uh, drugs used to relieve pain, and then we'll move on to uh, talk about antipsychotic drugs in our next lecture. So, um, important to understand some alternatives to using narcotics for pain relief. Um, keep in mind, these lectures are for educational purposes only. Always consult your physician or pharmacist for any questions about your medications or any drugs you might take. The information presented here is based on peer-reviewed scientific evidence. I want to talk a little bit about pain management, uh, and then we'll talk about what are called non-selective COX inhibitors, talk about COX-2 inhibitors, and then finally talk about the evidence for using cannabis for pain relief. So first question we have to think about is, are we talking about acute pain or are we talking about chronic pain? Do a, a quick introduction to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs the effects of those drugs, and steps to take prior to opioid use. So important question is acute versus chronic pain. Acute pain results from injury, disease, inflammation, generally comes on suddenly, um, and is usually self-limited. So well, this is a short-term pain situation. Chronic pain is a disease unto itself. And so this is a completely different uh, pain management problem is chronic pain versus acute. Oftentimes, chronic pain is made worse by both environmental and psychological factors. It's going to persist over a pretty long period of time and is often resistant to medical treatment. This is a very difficult uh, disease to treat and is incredibly frustrating for the people who are suffering from it. This causes significant problems to the patient, their family. They often can't work. Uh, so that's an integral part of treating chronic pain is managing that pain. Uh, and it's just oftentimes very difficult, particularly uh, in the current climate, it's oftentimes difficult for these patients to gain access uh, to drugs that they might need to treat that chronic pain. So let's start with some non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs. These drugs act at the local site of injury to reduce inflammation and to block the nociceptors, the pain receptors themselves. These drugs block what is called cyclooxygenase, which is an enzyme that is used to synthesize prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are released by the immune system, uh, which can cause pain and inflammation. They also often also cause um, fever. And so these are part of an immune response. And so these drugs are used to um, block that kind of immune response, uh, that pain, inflammation, and oftentimes fever. So these are referred to as COX inhibitors. We'll talk about uh, different types of COX inhibitors and how they work. COX-1 uh, tends to mediate the GI tract and blood platelets. COX-2 mediates inflammation. Unfortunately, a lot of the drugs that we use are nonspecific. So they uh, have effects on both. So for example, um, Advil or ibuprofen uh, affects both COX-1 and COX-2, which is why it can cause GI problems and can also cause reductions in blood platelets or platelets that are coming out of your blood. So some effects of these um, NSAIDs are reduction of inflammation. Uh, they are antipyretic, that is they reduce your body temperature for those who have a fever. Um, they can reduce pain without any sedation, so they are analgesic without sedation. Unfortunately, they can inhibit platelet aggregation, so they have anticoagulant effect, so these are non-selective drugs, aspirin, uh, ibuprofen and um, naproxen sodium are uh, examples of those types of drugs. You want to be careful with these in terms of how many you take. Um, particularly, and we'll talk about this uh, in a bit, um, Advil can be, uh, high doses can uh, be damaging to your kidneys. Unfortunately, other drugs like Tylenol are damaging to your liver, um, so you have to be uh, cautious in the use of these drugs. So here's some steps to take prior to, to getting to an opioid use, and so this is some good guidance for you to think about. Try a uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatory first. Um, possibly try an antidepressant with a norepinephrine activity, so one that is combined uh, with a norepinephrine reuptake. Potentially some of the anticonvulsant analgesics. And then um, long-acting uh, opioids uh, may be potentially a choice, particularly for a chronic pain patient. Mm -hmm. Not the uh, what we call PRN drug. So a PRN drug would be something like Lortab, whereas a longer-acting opioid might be uh, more appropriate. 
So certainly starting with the NSAIDs is a good place to start. Let's uh, talk a little bit about these COX inhibitors and uh, how they work. We'll talk about aspirin, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, and some miscellaneous nonspecific NSAIDs. So these non-selective COX inhibitors, uh, as I said before, inhibit both COX-1 and COX-2. The prototypical NSAID is aspirin. These are often referred to as aspirin-like drugs. Uh, they are used as analgesics and for long-term treatment of pain and inflammation from arthritis. Unfortunately, there can be some significant effects uh, on the GI tract, but they do have significant effects on pain, inflammation, and blood platelets uh, in the GI tract. So the pain and inflammation are the two things that we're after. Uh, the blood platelets in the GI tract, not so much. Now, um, some people have been told to take an aspirin a day to reduce their risk of cardiac incident. There is, there's been some updated information on that, so if you're taking an aspirin every day, please check with your doctor and be sure that that's what you, they want, um, because some, some of that information has changed. So it's certainly worth having a discussion uh, about uh, with your doctor. And certainly the GI tract, um, aspirin in particular, seems to have a great effect on the GI tract, as can um, Advil or ibuprofen. So aspirin uh, is most effective for low-intensity pain, you're going to reach a ceiling with no increasing effect seen. Uh, all you're going to get is more irritated. Uh, its antipyretic effect is due to its inhibition of prostaglandin synthesis in the hypothalamus. Uh, aspirin should not be used in children um, who have a fever, and I believe it's Rett syndrome is the um, risk for that. And so uh, Tylenol is the better choice in children. It does have significant anticoagulant properties. It has been used in low doses to prevent heart attack. Again, you may want to visit with your doctor about that. Um, I'm not familiar enough with the literature in that area to um, provide a, a good explanation of where it's at, but I do know there has been some questioning of that. Uh, big increase of risk of gastric bleeding uh, with aspirin. It seems to really um, have significant effects. Acetaminophen, uh, also known as Tylenol. This is known as uh, paracetamol in uh, the UK. It has very little efficacy in treating inflammation. Uh, so if your uh, problem is uh, inflammatory, sprained ankle, uh, pulled muscle, you really probably want to go with um, a different drug. Uh, it does not, however, inhibit platelet functioning. So if you're someone who takes a blood thinner, this is going to be really your only choice for pain relief. Um, it is safe for children. It does not produce as much gastric distress, but it does have significant hepatotoxicity. So you want to limit its use if you're drinking alcohol. So um, if you have a hangover and have a headache, my recommendation is not to use uh, Tylenol. There is a risk of hypertension in women with this drug, um, so keep that in mind. So Tylenol is very effective. It's very good uh, antipyretic. Um, and so oftentimes what doctors will recommend if you're running a long-term fever is to alternate between acetaminophen and ibuprofen. <clears throat> to limit the effects on the kidneys and to limit the effects on the uh, liver. So ibuprofen, which is often known as Advil, uh, can cause some gastric distress. It's not as bad as aspirin. Um, Over-the-counter dose is 200 milligrams. A prescription dose is 800 milligrams. For joint pain, this has actually been shown to be more effective than codeine. So if you have achy joints, anything that's... In, uh, causing inflammation, this is a particularly good choice. Uh, again, it's an analgesic and an anti-inflammatory, but it does have significant anticoagulant properties. So again, if you're on something like a blood thinner, uh, you want to be cautious in uh, using this drug, and oftentimes you're cautioned not to use them at all. Unfortunately, uh, this is one of the better drugs uh, for inflammation, as is naproxen, but it also has the same problem. So some other NSAIDs include uh, Mobic, Naproxen, which is Aleve, um, Oxaprozin, which is Daypro, and others. Uh, naproxen is the only one that's available over the counter. Uh, it has, has longer acting effects um, and may exert a cardioprotective effect. Um, I can certainly say from my own personal experience um, that when I, uh, one of my many joints that aches at my age, um, when they act up, um, the naproxen will really knock that back. Um, much more quickly than uh, ibuprofen. But that's just me. Uh, always be mindful of what works for you. 
So I want to talk then about some COX-2 inhibitors. There are both prescription and even natural COX-2 inhibitors. Um, so COX-2 plays a role in both inflammation and cancer. Uh, so COX-2 inhibitors, including aspirin, may reduce the risk of cancer. Um, they have fewer gastric effects because the COX-1 uh, is involved in the GI tract. Only one remains available. All the others were pulled for their cardiac effects. So Celebrex is the only um, synthetic COX-2 inhibitor that is still available. Uh, so this is the only COX-2 inhibitor in the U.S. It's as effective as aspirin in reducing pain and inflammation. Uh, has far less uh, gastric problems. Has no anticoagulant properties. Sorry, I keep moving that too quickly. Um, this drug works well for um, quite a few people. If you are allergic to sulfa drugs, this is a drug you shouldn't take. So keep that in mind. But it is uh, an option, so certainly something to talk to your doctor about if you're having um, joint pain. Biox and Baxtra were both um, treatments for osteoarthritis and chronic pain. Uh, both were uh, pulled from the market for their cardiac risks. Uh, finally, I want to talk about ginger. Uh, ginger is actually a natural COX-2 inhibitor. It's been found to be as effective as aspirin in treating arthritis pain and inflammation. It's also effective in treating motion sickness and morning sickness. Um, and there is some evidence that it, it does work uh, to reduce um, gastric distress, uh, etc. In fact, uh, in a lot of places, ginger is eaten after dinner to try to sort of uh, aid in digestion. Uh, so it's certainly a, a potential uh, for you to consider uh, as a natural uh, way to treat uh, inflammation. That gets us to cannabis. Uh, there is evidence in favor of uh, cannabis use for pain. It's certainly been shown to be effective for chronic neuropathic pain, particularly Sativex. Uh, it seems to be effective for other chronic pains, such as fibromyalgia and rheumatoid arthritis. There is some evidence for uh, this in treating HIV neuropathy, uh, which is a condition that's resistant to other treatments. <laughs> What's interesting about this is that uh, medical cannabis laws uh, have been uh, shown to significantly lower state level opioid overdose mortality rates. And so by legalizing marijuana, what we've seen in a lot of places is actually we've seen fewer deaths uh, from overdose. I think uh, that's something you sh we all should keep in mind as we are uh, sort of entering this new era. And then finally, as I've talked about in previous lectures, CBD oil appears to have pretty significant anti-inflammatory properties and may be useful for chronic arthritis. Uh, there certainly has been uh, in a number of people who have found uh, canine CBD oil uh, that has really helped their um, older dogs and their arthritis. So these are some alternatives uh, to these other drugs that you might try. Once again, for more information, uh, check out Julian's Primer of Drug Action. Perfect textbook, uh, very well written. Um, and of course, the National Institute for Mental Health and the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Thank you.